Chapter 29, Bleeding and Shock. Let's first start off with a review of the circulatory system. We got the pump, the pipes, the fluids. So we've got the pump, which is the heart. You should know all the pores, uh, anatomy of the heart, the ventricles and the atrium and how they work. You need to know your, vent, your uh, blood vessels, aortic uh, branches, how the blood flows to the end organs and then how it comes back into the heart through the venous system. Then you also need to know the, know the pulmonary circuit, how it goes in through the lungs and through the capillaries and back into the heart. So understanding that, and then we have the fluid. Any one problem with that causes shock. The primary function of the heart is to move blood throughout the body. The blood is that mechanism we have to move nutrients and gases and waste product throughout the body. So if the heart's not pumping, we're not moving things around. It has to have an adequate rate and rhythm. We learned for uh, cardiac output, the rate and rhythm are both uh, used to determine the cardiac output based on the volume. So we need to make sure everything's in function or in uh, normal functions then. The other arteries carry the blood away from the heart. Uh, these are blood vessels that have the thicker wall. They uh, allow for dilation and constriction. That helps us control our blood pressure based on the needs of the body if we need to increase the blood pressure or decrease the blood pressure. Capillaries are that microscopic blood vessel down at the cellular level that gives the ability for gas exchange, nutrient exchange, uh, very thin walled, easy for the uh, substances to go back and forth across into the cells. Then we have the veins which go back into the heart. They bring the blood back from uh, the end organs with all the byproducts on the way it drops off uh, through the kidneys and the liver to drop off the extra blood, uh, the byproducts, and then it makes its way through the lungs and drops off uh, the carbon dioxide. Uh, the difference with the venous system is that it's a lower pressure, so we have one-way valves in there to prevent back backflow, keeps the blood going the right direction. Fl uh, functions of the blood, it transports gases, oxygen, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, all the gases go throughout the, the bloodstream. It also moves nutrient, moves that glucose uh, molecule through to the end organ. Excretion, it brings out all the extra fluids that we don't need. Uh, it provides protection. The white blood cells that are floating around there looking for the infections, the, the bacteria, the fungi, the viruses. And it also helps us regulate the body functions. It is the main source of transportation for your hormones that regulate body functions. Perfusion, we've defined this under shock, adequate circulation of blood throughout the body. And then hyperperfusion is the inadequate perfusion. So let's talk about shock. It's basically inadequate perfusion. If hyperperfusion keeps going, organs and cells die. It's where we've talked about the kidneys being one of the most sensitive organs for tissue death. The brain is also up there with that uh, as far as tissue death with uh, lack of perfusion. So that's why we have altered mental status as one of our first things uh, we see from shock. Four causes of shock. Volume problems. We lose blood volume. Either uh, we're dehydrated or we have a uh, a bleed somewhere. We may have a pump problem. The heart doesn't pump adequately. Maybe they're having an acute myocardial infarction or there's some tissue damage to the heart. Blood vessel tone problems. The pipes get too big. We lose the ability to control the pipes, the blood vessels, and they dilate. And now you've got six liters of blood in a 12 liter container. And so you don't have the pressure you need to perfuse the rest of the body. Or you could have some type of obstruction from like a pulmonary embolism or a cerebral embolism that causes hyperperfusion to a certain very specific area of the body, which is a form of shock. So things we need to look for. Hypovolemia, blood loss, absolute hypo hypovolemia. We could have uh, plasma is removed from the circulatory system. That's called relative hypovolemia. 
you can't have people that have begun to donate plasma and they have not uh, answered the screening questions correctly and they've depleted their blood supply more than they anticipated and they can go into shock. So you could have not enough blood volume in the blood vessels so the pressure fails. Maybe they're, uh, they've got a, uh, a bone marrow issue, some type of cancer or something like that that causes a decreased production. If you have absolute and relative hypovolemia, either one's called uh, hypovolemic shock. If it's a direct relay, uh, direct caused by blood loss, it's called hemorrhagic shock. <clears throat> so let's talk about the pump failures. The heart doesn't move. Uh, doesn't uh, mechanically, it's not able to squeeze. Maybe there's damage to the heart. Maybe there's a myocardial infarction causing the heart to uh, not contract adequately. This is called cardiogenic shock. Blood vessel tone problems. The blood vessels dilate. Uh, it's use, usually called distributive shock. Uh, some types of distributive shock our anaphylactic shock, what we've talked about under uh, allergic reactions, neurogenic shock, which is a problem with our brain not sending the signals to the blood vessels to keep them contracted, and then septic shock, which is the infection that causes the leakage of the fluid out of the blood system into the interstitial tissue. If we have some type of blocked it's, uh, blood flow, it's called obstructive shock, pulmonary embolism, cardiac tamponade, and tension pneumothorax. We've got things that are blocking our ability to flow blood. When you are in shock, your body senses that there's danger, so it activates the fight or flight, para, uh, the sympathetic nervous system. The baroreceptors start releasing epinephrine and norepinephrine. Epinephrine, as we know from our pharmacology, causes blood vessels to constrict. It also has a side effect of you have cool, pale, sweaty skin. It shuts down the production of the uh, ki or the activity of the ur uh, kidneys, which causes a decrease in urine. It moves blood from the digestive system to more critical systems, so you could have nausea and vomiting. And it causes the heart to increase its rate and contractility, contractility to try to increase your blood pressure. So your epi and your norepi are in there trying to help compensate for whatever is causing your hypoperfusion. So compensation, the body senses the uh, decrease in perfusion and starts trying to uh, adjust. So you have uh, regulation of the volume. You will constrict the blood vessels. It will change the blood flow to certain body organs. Your gut doesn't need to function. So it's going to decrease that blood flow down there. It's going to increase your heart rate, increase your respiratory rate, try to increase your blood pressure to compensate. These are all the compensated shock uh, responses. Kids are really good at compensating. They will look almost normal even though they are farther down the line than adults with types of shock. If you have a mechanism on a kid that says there's a potential for uh, shock or hypoperfusion, treat the, pay the kid and don't wait for them to decompensate. They will uh, go up to the edge of the cliff and just fall off, unlike adults which slide down the hill gently. So any kid that has a fast heart rate, we're gonna consider has uh, potential for shock. Once we get past the compensated, we go to decompensated. We've used up all our energy to try to compensate. The muscles run out of fuel uh, and your body just gets to the point where it can't keep up. So you get a drop in blood pressure, you start getting anxious, altered mental status, your heart rate starts to slow down and your respiratory rate starts to slow down. Your body is running out of gas. Irreversible shock and death, that's from prolonged vasoconstriction, reduces the blood flow to the end organs, so your kidneys, your gut, your brain starts having tissue death. Um, as you go through this process, you start to have uh, potential for apnea and then eventually cardiac arrest. So it takes a little bit to get to this point. So if you've got a patient that is apneic or cardiac arrest and the in incident just occurred, consider other options besides hypovolemic shock. 
So look at your options when you're dealing with your patients. Patient assessment, try to find what caused it. Try to find what the mechanism is and how we can adjust our treatment based on that mechanism. Uh, look for compensation. If the heart rate's up and they have a mechanism, put the two pieces together and come up with the potential for uh, shock and treat the patient. Don't wait for them to decompensate. Do a good scene survey for the nature of illness or the mechanism of injury. Maintain your ABCs. Get a good primary assessment in there. It's determining level of consciousness and your priority uh, me, uh, body functions. Fix the airway problems almost immediately. If you, as soon as you find them, fix them. If you have a mechanism that says they are hypo, going to be hypovolemic or hyperperfused, start treating them aggressively with oxygen. Don't wait till they get hypoxic. Try to keep them breathing and keep them breathing adequately right away. Circulation, we're very concerned with the skin color, distal pulses, cap refill, and the heart rate. These are all going to tell us if they're trying to compensate or not or if they've decompensated. If you find active bleeding, fix the problem. Don't wait till later if it's a life threat type of bleed. And then a good set of vital signs to get your foundation and keep tra keep trending the vital signs every five minutes to see if you're going up or down or if you're compensating or decompensating. Good physical exam, head to toe, decap, BTLS, deformities, contusions, abrasions, punctures, burns, tenderness, laceration, swelling. Looking for everything you can find. Looking for all the mechanisms. Look for combinations of mechanisms. Just because they have a diabetic issue, Maybe they crashed into the wall, or maybe they crashed in the wall and they're having a diabetic issue. So look for the combination of everything. Get a good uh, foundation on the mechanism. Know what your system allows and what you they expect. Some EMS systems like to see pictures of the mechanism. So if that's in your protocols, in your guidelines, make sure that you're doing that. That gives the doctors and the further healthcare people more information to work with on when the as they're trying to assess your patient get a good history of what happened what led up to the event and establish the chief complaint what hurts them the most treatment of shock all depends on what cause is causing the shock if it's a myocardial infarction we're treating that if it's a anaphylaxis reaction we're treating that uh, if it's hypovolemic, we're stopping the bleeding. If it's external, if it's internal, you're going to have to get them to the hospital so they can go in surgically and fix the problem. So our critical problems we're going to deal with in our primary assessment, do your ABCs, address any issue you find in your ABCs immediately. Get a good hands-on, head-to-toe body assessment, a rapid trauma assessment. Identify anything else that might need to be treated right now or on the way to the hospital. And then use your uh, hospital or your uh, transport options. Pick the best way to get the patient to the right hospital. Things that kill people during the trauma process. Acidosis. Acidosis being created by that anaerobic metabolism at the cellular level. That's what's causing it. Or poor perfusion and they're not blowing off the carbon dioxide, which is car causing more uh, acid to build up in the body system. Hypothermia. Hypothermia causes a decrease in coagulation. So we want to make sure that we're treating the patient for hypothermia. Even if it's a nice warm day, put a blanket on them. It's a simple solution. Do not make them trauma naked and then leave them there. You want to see and then cover. Coagulopathy, if they have an underlying condition that increases their uh, rate of coagulation, Make sure we're addressing that when we're taking them to the hospital. Treatment, rapid transport. Some services I've worked with, if you're on scene more than 10 minutes on any call, they wanted you to document the reasons. There were legitimate reasons like extrication, convincing the patient they needed to go, other things like that, but they wanted us to be thinking 10 minutes or less off scene. Prevent hypoxia. Make sure you're giving them a, a, the adequate amount of oxygen. Prevent their heat loss. So you're putting a blanket on them. Put them supine. 
Keeping the brain the same level as the heart makes everything go a little bit easier. And then definitely call ALS. They have the option to add a IV fluids, and in some systems they're actually adding uh, whole blood to the uh, response protocols. They also have uh, additional ways to correct the underlying cause of your hypo, uh, hypoperfusion. Go to the appropriate location. You're going to have to make a decision. Is the closest hospital appropriate or is the better care appropriate? If you are trying to secure ABCs and you haven't initiated that or you haven't accomplished it, you need to make sure you go to the appropriate, the closest hospital. Even a level four trauma center can secure an airway if that's necessary. But if you've got ABC secured and you need a level one trauma center, make sure you get to that right, the right location. So maintain the airway breathing, keeping heat loss taken care of, get the patient supine and transport with a request ALS. All right, let's talk about bleeding. Hemorrhage is severe bleeding. Happens internal, external. The good thing about bleeding is it all stops eventually. What we want to do is make sure we can stop it before it becomes an issue. So there's some simple ways we can stop it. Arterial bleeding, squirting. It is pulsating because it's high pressure. Every time the heart beats, it squirts more. It's bright red because it's well oxygenated. If it's a steady, slow flow and it's darker, it's probably venous. But arteries and veins are close together, so you could have a combination of both. But just know it's it's it, it's important to stop both. Kepler bleeding slow, even it's like a road rash on your skin or your knees. Uh, it's easy to stop. Just put direct pressure on it, and it usually stops on its own unless there's underlying medical conditions. External bleeding, by the definition, it occurs outside the body. Something penetrates the skin destroys the underlying blood vessels, and the blood comes to the surface. So what you're looking for is the size and severity of the wound. Arterial bleeding, you're going to be identified with bright red blood, spurting, matching the heartbeat. It's full of oxygen, so you're losing something very important for your blood supply. Venous blood, darker, low pressure, so it's oozing or flowing. It's not squirting. Uh, but it can be just as life-threatening as the arterial bleed. Junctional hemorrhage, that is the junction between an extremity and the body. So the upper arm or the uh, groin area, very large arteries and veins. They're not protected interior. Uh, they don't have a lot of muscle st structure. Or it's anywhere you get a pulse is a junction. So those are uh, high potential for massive bleeding. They do have a new tourniquet uh, that will address a femoral junctional bleed. It is not something I've seen carried on local ambulances, but it's something to consider uh, if you're working in an uh, environment that may have uh, high potential for junctional type of hemorrhages or uh, IEDs that would damage the lower body. Capillary bleeding, superficial wounds, oozing slowly, uh, most of it stops on its own. If you need to, put a little gauze on it and dry, apply direct pressure, and, and it will stop almost immediately. Things that make bleeding worse, drugs that uh, inhibit blood clots. Because they're on a blood anticoagulant therapy because of a history of strokes or uh, myocardial infarctions or atrial fibrillation or pulmonary embolisms, they may not be able to clot when they really need to. Uh, maybe it's hypothermia, they're cold. Cold reduces the clotting factor, so we need to uh, get them warmed up and keep them warm so they can maintain that clotting. Blood carries bloodborne pathogens, that's in the name. Uh, Use your standard precaution, gloves, mask, eyewear, gown, gown if you can. Uh, most times if you've got a tr critical trauma, you don't have the ability to get the gown on. Uh, always wear, always wash your hands after the call. Hot soapy water is the cure for most of our things that ill. 
identifying and controlling massive bleeding with the first few seconds primary assessment. So we always say airway breathing circulation, but if you see massive hemorrhage, you stop it right away. It doesn't matter if we're getting oxygen into the lung tissue if we have no blood. So we need to stop the bleeding almost immediately. So most of the times you're responding with more than one person, you can have one person stop the bleeding while the next person starts your airway and breathing. If you have non-massive bleeding, you do your assessment and you fix it after the fact. Um, if you if you're unsure, stop it now. You can all it's it's never wrong to stop bleeding unless you're taking time away from airway breathing when it's a non-life threatening bleed. If you think the patient may have shock, start treatment. Don't wait until they start decompensating to start treating the shock. Use your mechanism, use your experience and your gut feelings and treat your patient based on that. A stopping bleeding, we have uh, direct pressure as our first option. Take your hand, maybe get a, some gauze or something in it that's absorbing, absorbing and put direct pressure. If that doesn't work, you can go for hemostatic agents. Use a little quick clot there, wound packing, packing something into the wound itself. Tourniquets, they are going in and out of style constantly, but right now we've got good use of tourniquets. Uh, get those on and get the patient treated as quick as possible. And then using the specialized compression junctional devices if they are available, if that's what you need. You need to control that ex external bleeding to maintain the blood flow. We can replace volume with IV fluids, but we can't replace the capabilities of the blood. So we have to stop the bleeding. Always use standard precautions, even to the end of the call when you're cleaning up. Direct pressure, firm, hard pressure, the palm of your hand or fingers and you keep it until the bleeding stops. You don't let go to see if it stopped over and over. You wait plenty of time. Once you've uh, got the bleeding stop, you apply a pressure dressing, something solid to, to wrap it up. We will look at those in the classroom. Once you put a dressing on, you leave it on. You don't keep peeling it off to see if it worked. Wound packing, usually these are abdominal or uh, junctional areas where we're pushing gauze into that void that's created by the, uh, the injury. So you're pushing uh, gauze into that wound until you get good contact with the, uh, the blood vessel that's bleeding. Pressure dressing, we have the combat gauze or combat uh, dressing it used to be called the Israeli dressing uh, it's a very secure very easy to use wound uh, pressure dressing we will practice with those in the class hemostatic agents you have to apply direct pressure but you have to uh, be aggressive and getting it into the wound they come impregnated with the uh, substance that helps increase clotting factors dramatically and you keep pushing it into the wound until it stops bleeding. The ones I've used it on is uh, probably five to ten minutes of pushing in and holding pressure and it's not a pleasant uh, feeling having somebody stick your fingers or stick their fingers into your wound. Here's what the combat gauze looks like. It's just gauze with a special substance on it. Tourniquets, there are many types of tourniquets on the market. Preferred to have a commercial tourniquet. If the direct pressure doesn't work, you put a tourniquet on. You put it as high as you can on the extremity. Some sources say two inches above the wound. Some sources say as high as you can. Our local preference is as high as you can. And it's critical to place it between the wound and the heart. You don't want to put a distal to the wound because it really won't work. Here's one of the commercial tourniquets. Notice it's on the upper arm. 
We like the upper extremities because there's one bone and the blood vessels are easier to compress. If you have it on a lower extremity, the blood vessels do tend to go between the two bones and the lower extremities or the distal portions. It makes it harder to get good compression. Follow the manufacturer's instructions. Read the instructions before you need to. Know how they go on. Uh, once you put them on, leave them on. We do not have to take them off, loosen them in certain time periods or anything like that. You put them on, you leave them on. Up to 12 hours is a standard now. Note the uh, time the tourniquet was put on the patient. Our tourniquets in our system are orange, so they're easy to find. Uh, except for our tactical teams the, and the cops. They carry the dark ones so they could still uh, remain a little bit covert when they're, even if they have a tourniquet on. Junctional tourniquets go across the groin, apply pressure to the femoral arteries through a downward uh, compression system, and uh, work very well. It's just uh, they are used for places that have a higher incident of uh, need. There is a potential to elevate wounds to use gravity to increase the pressure needed and decrease the bleeding. So if there's no musculoskeletal injuries, no impaled objects, no spine injuries, you can raise the offending extremity up higher. Splinting reduces bleeding by keeping the bones from moving around. Air splints, great tool. You inflate them around the extremity and causes counter pressure, which will help with bleeding. An ice pack. Simple little tool, controls the pain, controls the bleeding, causes vascular constriction. You put that and the splint on your patient, they'll be very happy with you. Head injuries, we do not try to stop the bleeding from an internal source. Um, it's actually helping the brain by getting rid of intracranial pressure. But if you have external uh, bleeding on the surface of the skull, then we, we stop we try to stop it. If it's a nosebleed or epitaxis, have the patient sit up and lean forward. Do not have them lean back because the blood flows into their, their throat and causes airway obstructions. So squeeze the nose, lean them forward, keep them calm. If they go unresponsive, put them in recovery so they don't drain all their blood into their throat. They do make, uh, they're called rhino rockets. They're like little mini tampons that go up the nose. Some of them are even impregnated with quick clot. So you can shove those up the nose and keep them from bleeding. Start with direct pressure. Go to hemostatic agents, wound packing, tourniquets. Figure out what, hap what works and do it. Uh, there is no judging on how you got it done as long as you stop the bleeding before the patient dies. Rapid transport and call ALS. Get some help on the way. Internal bleeding, a little bit harder to stop. What we need to do on these is identify the potential and get them to the appropriate care facility as quick as possible. You can bleed up to a liter in each leg or a couple liters into the gut from just one injury. So it's very important to identify the risk of internal bleeding and get them to the right care. Look at your mechanisms of blunt force trauma. Falls, motor vehicles, motorcycles, auto pedestrians, blast injuries, anything that's gonna cause tissue damage interior to the body. Gunshot wounds, stab wounds, impaled objects, things that penetrate the body and cause damage as it goes in. What we're looking for are injuries to the surface of the body, saying something damaged it from the outside and caused problems on the inside. So we we'll have bruising, swelling, tenderness, pain swollen or deformed extremities. You may have bleeding from body orifices, from the mouth, the rectum, the vagina. 
all things tell us something's not right inside, and we've got active bleeding because it's coming out. On the belly, we're looking for tender, rigid, or distended. The blood will react with the uh, peritoneal muscles, or the lining of the peritoneum, and then impact the, rect uh, the abdominal muscles and cause severe rigidity. It's very solid. We've talked about coffee like uh, coffee ground uh, vomit, black tarry stools. And then look for the symptoms of shock. What do you see? Uh, do they have an increased blood pressure, or in increased pulse, increased respiration, decreased mental status? Are they showing us that they have something going on inside before we can see it? This is bruising around the shoulder. You can see all that ecmosis. All the, uh, the the bruises around the surface of the skin, that's blood accumulating. Patient care, ABCs. Level of consciousness, airway, breathing, circulation, lots of oxygen. If you have external bleeding, control it, but don't wait to transport. If you have the ability to splint them so it doesn't cause more damage, put a splint on if you have only an option for one splint, a backboard is a full body splint. So use that. Put a blanket on them. Keep them warm and transport to the appropriate facility, the level of one, two or three trauma. If you have questions, feel free to bring them to class. Discuss them with the instructor. Have a discussion with fellow students and let's get some answers for you. Thanks and have a great day.